the idea of this session is to move on from some of the policy discussion that we had this morning and the big picture around Paris to dive a little bit more into the detail about what's happening on the ground and what individual uh, participants in the private sector are actually engaged in. And I think, as um, Minister Frydenberg said in his speech this morning, part of the original in initiative of the Asia-Pacific um, uh, Rainforest Partnership was to really try to start to engage with the private sector. And as part of that role, um, M Minister Hunt set up what, what is the Asia-Pacific uh, Rainforest Partnership Private Sector Roundtable, and that roundtable was really to bring private sector into the discussion. I think this is a very important point because a lot of the work around forest conservation and around RED has been government-led or through the multilaterals, and quite often it doesn't interface with those individuals on the ground doing either agroforestry or doing conservation type projects and there is a, a gap between those two areas of activity and so in many ways the round table was to um, was to really focus on how to bring the private sector into the discussion and, and that's what's been done um, and so Minister Hunt s s set up the round table and um, as chair of that that round table, table he appointed Ada Greenway, uh, so, so, sorry, Ada Greenberry, who's the Manager Director of Sustainability and, the St and Stakeholder Engagement at Asia Pulp and Paper. Uh, Ada has, has taken a lead role in, in running that round table and bringing it together and will tell us a little bit about what the round table has produced. Um, next to Ada, I've got Mary Kate Bullen. Uh, Mary Kate's the Associate Director at New Forest and has been a, a contributor to, what, to, to, to the papers that have been produced. Also from PT Rimba uh, Utama, we have uh, Dasano Hatano. Dasano has been very active in doing a conservation project, a large project on the ground, of which there is also a policy paper written in, in the documents, which you'll hear a little bit more about. And I think um, Dasano is very important because he, talk, he will talk today, as will Ada, about actual conservation projects and how you finance those uh, separate from sort of financing sustainable agriculture type projects. And then finally we have Miss uh, Perpetua George, who's the Assistant General Manager for Sustainability at Wilmar, and welcome. And so we're, with our four distinguished guests, uh, welcome you all today to, to, onto the panel. Um, so what I'd like to do is to start off by just asking um, Ada to begin by talking a little bit about the round table and what we were trying to achieve and also perhaps introduce the, the, um, the papers that have been done. And then I'm going to go through and get each panellist to talk a little, little, little about what their activities have been. So, Ida, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Martine. Um, good, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. So, um, the uh, private sector roundtable was set up, uh, as Martine said, with the previous Environment Minister of Australia, Mr Minister Hunt, and uh, requested our requested us, myself and Martina, to chair and co-chair the private sector roundtable. So as the chair of the private sector roundtable over the last couple of months, I would like to highlight the role that the private sector is uh, already playing in forest restoration and conservation. The projects uh, put forth by the members and many more who, who are not here are already evidence of, of our role in uh, forest conservation. There are remaining challenges um, that, um, um, that we are facing, uh, such as sca scaling up efforts, which is why we have tried to outline our recommendations for addressing a few of these key challenges in the policy briefs that we put forward for discussion. Uh, we launch it today. Um, I'm sure some of you can have a copy of this up front, if not, uh, the uh, private sector roundtable and the secretariat will be able to give you the, the soft copy. There are a number of key challenges that we need to resolve if we want to make the Paris Agreement a reality and arrest deforestation in the Asia Pacific and also in the region. Number one, how do we, how do we incentivize business when partic partic participation in the uh, carbon market is voluntary? and the carbon price are very low. Secondly, how do we actually monitor progress? What baseline are we working from? And most importantly, how can we organize finance mechanism so that the cash actually reach the forests? Uh, based on my own experience in the, uh, the company I'm working for, this Asia Pulp and Paper Group, uh, 
uh, we launched our forest conservation policy uh, in 2013 as our landmark policy. It consists of key building blocks that uh, we use to create hopefully a more sustainable business model, including halting all natural forest clearance, management or um, responsible, more responsible management of peat, resolving social conflict, free and private informed consent, and etc. The overarching principle uh, behind all of our management and conservation efforts, the landscape approach. In principle, it is the principle that the conservation efforts goes beyond administration, administrative boundaries and will only succeed if the sustainability of the whole landscape is taken into account. And all the stakeholders within that landscape work together towards very similar goal. The initial step of the implementation of our landscape approach is the Integrated Sustainable Forest Management Plan. And through this process, we have increased the conservation areas across our supply chain from previously 383,000 hectares to more than 500,000 hectares. Well, area to work together with community has increased from 370,500 hectares to 420,000 hectares. So as part of our best practice, uh, management for peat strategy, for example, uh, more responsible peatland management to, to rewet the area we also managed to, uh, uh, conducted LIDAR mapping across 4.5 million hectares of peatland in Sumatra and Kalimantan and building more than 5,000 dams in the canal perimeters. So those are just a few examples of the progress we made on the ground, Martin. Thank you. Ada, could you just talk to us a little bit about um, the, I, I guess the, the journey that, that APP has come on from being traditionally more a forestry company to embracing sustainability and how that has, ha, has come about and how that has led to forest conservation. Yeah, could you tell us a little bit about how the journey that APP has come on, which you have overseen, to look more at forest conservation and not just forest production? Because uh, we see forest conservation actually as an investment um, with with the uh, an, uh, launch of our forest conservation policy, for example, uh, we have invested uh, in the last three years, we have invested more than 200, 200 million dollars for three years in the uh, implementation of forest conserv conservation policy. And why? Because it's not just we want to be green or we want to be environmentally friendly, we also treat it as an investment. The return of, in, return of investment that we're measuring right now is basically three folds. Uh, one is definitely commercially, uh, return of customers, of course, uh, uh, now environmentally friendly. Uh, procurement is basically the new business as usual. Uh, you cannot basically survive, you cannot survive in the market without implementing a good, uh, robust uh, environmental policy. And secondly, of course, the um, return of investment from the landscape itself, uh, restoring forests and conserving forests is basically um, a, a risk management for our natural resource, which is the plantation, reducing risk of uh, pests and diseases, reducing risk of fires and also encroachment. And the third one, which is a much longer term, is of course the, um, uh, the greenhouse gas uh, emission itself. Martin, can I provide the palm perspective? Sure. Um, so a very quick introduction to Wilmar. So Wilmar again is the world's biggest edible oils trader. Um, we were in the same boat as APP um, in the early 2000s. So if any of you remember from the 2005 to 2008, nobody would touch Wilmar. We were so bad. We were so bad in the palm sector. Um, that made us very quickly realize that that wasn't a good way to sustain business. So much like APP's model, um, in 2013, Wilmar also adopted a no deforestation, no peat, no exploitation policy, very much mirroring around the New York commitments. Um, and again, but the point, the reason why Wilmar is doing this is because it is good business. And the role of the private sector, I believe, not just for forestry, but for the palm guys, agribusiness, is to ensure um, reduced impacts on deforestation or reduced impacts on forests is good business and that's the only way to make it work. Okay, well, um, we might now hear from Mary-Kate just to, because you also are running a business that, 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 that has its revenues primarily from undertaking timber activities in a sustainable manner. Do you want to just run us through uh, what new forests are doing and their philosophy on this? Sure, thanks Martin. Um, I think I'll start off by explaining quickly who New Forest is, because I think we're a different type of participant at this event for most people. 
Um, New Forest is an investment manager, and we manage funds that invest in sustainable forestry and conservation assets. I don't think there's actually a lot of capital providers or finance side folks in the room, um, but you know it's a very important segment of what the private sector is doing here. And I think what Pep said and what Ida have said have mentioned the external pressures and that that relies uh, Im impacts us as well as an investor and what are the expectations from our clients and broader stakeholder groups. So our clients are primarily pension funds, some sovereign wealth funds, reinsurance companies, very large institutional investors. And as we heard this morning from Minister Friedenberg from Australia, institutional investors have woken up to sustainable development and that's come from the Paris Agreement, it's come from the SDGs and it's come from you know, a, a momentum that's been growing over, I'd say, the past decade and, and really strengthening in 2015 to a, a good culmination in Paris. Um, so what we have as a duty of, as an investment manager, is to be a steward of that money and to make sure that it's invested for both a financial return, but also to make sure that we're protecting our client's reputation, protecting our own reputation, controlling for environmental and social risk, but also increasingly, it's not just about risk, it's about looking to see what are the proactive values that we can get out of environmental and social management. One thing about the type of investments we do, we're not investing in companies that are on the stock exchange, we're not looking to turn a dollar quarter to quarter a day to day, we're actually buying forestry companies or land or forests and looking to manage them well over the long term so they get an increase in total value and are also providing income from revenue from timber products, rubber, other products. That's really important because if we think about long-term perspective, we're not going to be cutting today just to have a dollar today. It's about the total package of that value. And so I think that's one thing that helps us address the lack of value that's in natural capital today. So while we do lack a carbon market incentive in this part of the world, while we lack biodiversity, monetary value, or a way to understand what biodiversity is really worth to a business like any of ours, we do know that over the long term these things matter and that managing them can help produce that total long-term value as well as reduce risk today and tomorrow. Okay, so, so, so all three of you have touched on the fact that, the, that you're all in, in private sector businesses that are basically in the, the timber, palm oil. The, you're, in the, you're in the business of producing products that produce an economic return. Um, Dasana, we're going to turn to you now and have you talk about you're at the other end of the spectrum where you are, you are in a, a business that is basically conservation where you produce a product which Ada's already told us there isn't a market for at the moment. So I'd like you to just talk us through what it is that you're doing and, 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 the, and the economics of that. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'm glad that actually I'm the last one to speak with, with these outstanding ladies in, next to me. Um, well, for, you know, in this case, Wilmar and APP, conservation is good for business. For us, it's our business. So it, it, is, it is a different you know, business plan here. So just to give you a little bit of broad, uh, uh, background, I, um, I, I founded this company about my own company seven years ago uh, with the idea when Red Plus was sort of like a, a, the hype of uh, Bali Cop then. I, I, have, um, I actually came, came back from New York and uh, I worked for JP Morgan. So I'm a banker uh, in, in my previous practice and I came back and I realized there, is, there should be a value for us to invest in conservation and restoration. So we we're sort of ahead in our time seven years ago. But I think uh, the lesson learned over that seven years of time are probably the most valuable time in terms of my experience as an entrepreneur in this space uh, for a few reasons. I think the first one is to start seeing that there has to, there probably a new business model that has to be implemented by, you know, by the world nowadays. And uh, I think there should be a way we can do this sustainably while you know, we are preaching for uh, protecting the forest and conserving the forest seven years ago. At that time, Wilmar was still sort of like in the production side. Um, and now we actually converge where you, know, you have agriculture company, pulp and paper company start talking about protection, where I start talk, talking about protection seven years ago. Now, you know, they used to do production, now talk about protection. Now, actually, we are doing protection and we're actually going to production. But I think to answer your question, Martin, in terms of the financial, uh, it's, I have to say that uh, the reason why there are not that many project developers like us in Indonesia because there is no sign of financial incentive. I have been doing this for seven years and our company have not received any revenue. So that's a, that's a challenge itself. I mean, somebody, all my colleague from JP Morgan in New York asked me, Darsono, why do you even do this? 
You know, you're on the right race all the time. You know how we think. You know, we keep on telling people that we think long term, but it's always about short term benefit that you can get yourself. But I think, um, you know, that's uh, for me, it's about um, doing something right. It's about, at least there's an idealism and dream part of it. But I think what makes me more in, you know, open my eyes is actually the way we do things. Because when we started seven years ago, we start seeing the benefit of this from a climate perspective, getting the carbon revenue. But I think we also realize that it's actually good for the communities. You know, that's how we've been working uh, very hard in terms of getting, you know, all these ac activities before we get our license, like we're getting the participation map exercise for tenure rights. We, we, you know, I personally go to the village myself to talk to the people. But in, at the end, the finance, you know, we, my company has been putting a lot of money out. There's a lot of outlay money has been putting out. And we're still hoping for the market to come. And I really think that uh, there has to be a way to get this um, uh, final, oh, the fact to get this thing solved in a way. Otherwise, you've been talking again and again. You know, the last 10 years, you've been talking about this uh, carbon credit, red plus, and it never materialized. So this is something that I think we have to look into in terms of how we, private sectors, public sectors, think differently to get the, the financing because uh, there's a lot of initiative like the Norway initiative with $1 billion. But I think, you know, the fact is there's a, um, you have to be more practical because we, as a, as a project developer, we can prove to you what we have been doing for the past seven years, how it's that give benefit to the communities, it's good for the climate, and there has to be somehow compensation being given to, you know, people, the private sector who wants to engage. Then you can actually scale up because everybody's looking at Darsono and said, hey, we're just waiting for you to come. If we start making money, we'll jump into it. But that, again, there's a lack. I mean, it takes, uh, I mean, the lesson learned from this experience of seven years is it's really take a long time to get the trust from communities. So to actually start a Red Plus project takes some time too, so. So, so can you just describe to the audience your actual project? Can you just actually explain what it is okay. you actually do? So basically, our, my, my company, we, uh, the, the company that I formed, we actually protect and restore about 150,000 hectares of peatland in central Kalimantan. So this is quite intact, 90% intact, 10% need to do some kind of restoration. But I think our business model is not just about restoring per se the environment. I think it's about looking at the, the communities surrounding that area. How can we actually engage communities? Because we know that the, you know, the cost of deforestation or illegal logging, all these fires are actually based on communities. Uh, you know, then how, how we can actually enhance and, you know, uh, their livelihood, make them sustainable to, you know, to look into that in a very long-term basis. So, you know, my company has been, you know, we start engaging community from day one. We, we work with uh, 34 villages. You know, we have all these activities that we have. And I think our company have even signed MOU with all these villages. But I can tell you, it, it takes some time, you know, to, to start this process. You really need two to three years. You really have to really do, go, go to, uh, to the field. And the reality is you can actually, you know, um, it's, good for, it's, it's not good for business. It's our business. Because for a project like us to be verified by VCS, you need all of that ingredient to make that happen. So not only that, it's, a, it's an open book. So it's a very transparent process. And I think that's something that we can learn over time because people are always questioning whether Red Plus project works. But there's a, there's a mechanism that you actually can look into it and be transparently and say that, yes, you know, the project that Darsona are working on in Santa Kalimantan is benefiting the communities also benefiting from the climate because the fact is you know even last year when during the the fire season we have minimal hot spot and fire so those are the things that we nowadays we can prove to the world there's a project existing project that can have that kind of achievement so so i hope that uh, you know this also opened a lot of eyes for people in terms of getting where the market is because i i i know for sure my project will survive but in order for us to scale up there has to be a incentive for others to join as well Okay, so you've just described quite eloquently what it is that your project does and what it, and, and, the, and the outcomes it is producing. So I'd now like to ask all the other three panellists, would any of you invest in or buy from DeSano's project? Now, now um, uh, Mary-Kate, you said you're representing institutional investors. Can you convince your institutional investors to put $10 million into his project and buy his carbon and his biodiversity benefits? That's a good question. Um, probably when Darsona was starting his project, we also started looking at red projects in Indonesia, and we don't have them today. Uh, we were doing them on behalf of dedicated institutional clients, and when the regulatory framework wasn't there, the clear market signal wasn't there, they decided not to proceed. 
Um, and so we, you know, we have to honor that. And uh, from an investment perspective, we weren't able to continue. You know, fortunately, it's been it's been a long eight years for some people, and uh, I think things are getting to the point where we could start to look at them again. Uh, we manage the Tropical Asia Forest Fund, which is a $170 million fund looking to invest in sustainable forestry in Asia. And within that, we are able to do red projects alongside other investments. So a bit of the protection production sort of combination that Darsona has mentioned is becoming increasingly looked at. Um, we, we haven't been looking at standalone red projects for quite some time, but if there were the right signals, we absolutely would. In response to California creating a cap and trade system that includes forest carbon as offsets, we've now got a dozen projects registered or under contract with landowners, including four Native American tribes across the country, and more than 100,000 hectares lined up in those projects. And that's what happens when there's effective regulation that provides a clear incentive to groups like ours. We can take that to landowners. We can explain it even within a Native American tribal situation, how this works, what the benefits are, and that we can put the dollars to work. And investors like that. We've got a very happy client in that project. We'd be more than happy to do it in Southeast Asia. So, so on that point, I can ask you, what do you think then to move money into that space is required? in order to make that happen? And do you think the current approaches are, are, are working? I, I don't want to say too much about Red Plus, but I just get it, I need to get it off my chest. Um, we, we all know the actual number of deliver payment is just a fraction of many of us already hope. Hundreds of Red Plus pilot projects have been initiated since 2007, and according to the report um, an analysis I received, only about four had sold carbon credits. This leaves the large majority of Red Plus projects hanging in balance with no predictability or stability on how that might change in years to come. This is, this is not a combination which market for us more valuable standing. In fact, it creates an environment where Red Plus style investment are seen as increasingly risky and many players have back away from the market. Um, if the goal of Red Plus is truly to keep the forest standing, we do need to make some changes. The, the issue of timing is critical. If Red Plus and other donor-funded schemes must stick to the payment by result mechanism, then more needs to be done to, to channel funding towards supporting communities involved in Red Plus project to meet their short-term needs while they wait for longer-term result-based payment through Red Plus to come through. We, we're working with very similar programs in our uh, supply chain with our ag agroforestry program, as part of which we are supporting smallholders to build capacity for developing alternative livelihood and intercropping to provide them with short-term sources of cash flow and food while also keeping existing forests intact. It will stop them from further encroachment or destroying the forest. And then uh, we support them as they wait for the slower growing crops to bear fruit. Um, so a better framework would establish the level of payment upfront if certain parameters were included in the program design with indicators for short-term performance on carbon and non-carbon benefits. I have a direct uh, example with this. I mean, working with some organization, we're working with the community for this agroforestry program. Communities simply will not commit to anything based on promises. They do need to see, they need to believe in, they need evidence. They need to be shown that this new system works. They need to see evidence that this new system actually give them, give them uh, crops or food, and then they, they will commit to that. So we need to invest upfront first. And then yes, we do have to have, uh, we need to have a, a clear indicators and everything and clear MRV system and everything else, but we do need to invest upfront. And that's what we are trying to do here with every members on this panel. And then we need to come up with a better finance mechanism to support this, to, to upscale these, 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 these efforts. Um, I think from the palm sector, we would echo that. I think the, the, the complication, again, is, is if you look at the agribusiness sector, it's not really set up for REDD or Red Plus, um, simply because, look, we're not in the forest business. We are planters, and we're in agriculture. So to suddenly be um, required to look at you know, quite complicated structures of, of projects, I think, is beyond the capability of a lot of um, planting organizations or planting companies, Wilmar being one of them. You know, we, we have a very good uh, conservation, a forest conservation team, but again, they are quite limited in terms of trying to put together very complicated CDM projects. Um, and so, you know, the rhetoric from the palm 
companies will basically be, well, if the big boys are having problems with that, what more the small and medium growing guys? Um, so the complication is, is a major factor, and I think in, in the fact that essentially, we're not seeing the money. The money is not coming down to the ground, and I think that's the reality. Um, and again, you know, the, the communities, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, playing a rerun of the Wendy's commercial, where's the beef, but where's the money? Um, <laughs> you can't get them on board. Um, you know, there, there is a certain limit to what you can say, oh, yeah, 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 it's coming, it's coming. And, you know, eight years down the line, nothing. Um, so it is, it's an important point, and particularly, I think, in Indonesia, the discussion has, uh, to a certain degree, I think, excluded um, forests that occur on lands that are not gazetted forests, that are not for a permanent forest estate. Um, and I think there needs to be some recognition from not just the Indonesian government, but essentially the, the Southeast Asian governments in, um, in general around, you know, what do you do with forests that are under pressure that are not gazetted as forest estate? Um, and I think a lot of governments, you know, including my home state of Sabah in Malaysia, um, are only just getting on board with the fact that, look, okay, we, we have to deal with um, forests. Um, and emissions from those um, outside of the permanent forest estate. So these are, I think, uh, a lot of the major issues, um, in, in particular affecting the palm sector guys or the agribusiness guys, um, which do need to be addressed um, at a very top level in, in these countries. But you know, essentially, the reality on the ground is there is no money. Maybe. <clears throat> I think um, I want to basically share the experience. Like, this is exactly the point of our company, you know, we're willing to take the risk to put the money up front. That's what we do. For example, just give you an example, you know, after we get our licenses, you know, we identify, basically, we've been working very hard with the communities in terms of identifying what the livelihood program that they have. So our company, through a process of very bottoms up village planning process, you know, to actually start uh, identifying what are the alternative livelihood, and we have a program that we have. So we not only that we create a, a, a program, we also help them working with the local NGO to create institution on a village by village basis. You know, build the institution, go through basically also, not, and then teach them the governance, and then basically channeling the money. So in this case, we, we do we the company, our company, actually give them a grant. We give a grant to all these 13 villages, and then those money are being given to a microfinance to a certain group. And uh, the good thing is, uh, you know, we've been funding about, I think, we, the, the reality on the ground is you have to also look at the capacity. And when you start throwing them too much money, it's going to be too, a lot of problems. When you don't throw any money, it's going to be a problem. So I think we do have to do a bottoms-up uh, planning properly. And the good news is uh, we started this uh, last, uh, about last year in May. We signed an MOU with 13 villages. We're funding on average about $10,000 per village for all this alternative livelihood. So we are doing a lot of microfinancing involving up to 1,000 people. And then, uh, you know, all of, uh, all of basically about uh, $120,000 that we spent for this. And uh, we, you know, for, for fishery program, for cow breeding, for, you know, all this paddy, all this agroforestry, all, all the activities that we have. And the good news is I just got a report a few weeks ago that the 120000 that we invest actually now is it's worth $150,000. So there is really a, a value if you invest in communities. They are willing to work hard for it, and then they, they are being, they're being part of this. So it is proven that we, you know, we take risks, but the risk that we're taking is actually benefit to the communities. But at the end, just like uh, Mary said, it's about signal, the market. If, there's no, if, no, if my project in the next two, two years, we're not going to find buyers, it's very hard for us to be sustainable because we are in a business. We already invested north of $5 million in this project, you know, if we have to continue to fund all these activities, you know, with, uh, I mean, we have a staff. My, our, well, before we got our license, I'm the only employees of uh, RMU. But once we got a license, we have, you know, like, for example, during the high um, fire season last year, we have about up to 250 employees because we, we do all this fire prevention program, all these kind of things. But this needs, these are operating costs that has to be covered by the revenue. Uh, the, but I, I cannot give excuses that, um, that the, the fact is our project just recently got validated in the VCS. Uh, it's, it's, we should be proud because it's the biggest uh, Red Plus project registered in the world in terms of number of emission reduction. Uh, but I think uh, hopefully by the end of this year, we're going to have our credit verified. So we, then we have a credit to be sold. Because right now, I'm still, I cannot complain because I have no product to be sold yet. But let's see by next year, maybe in the next 12 to 24 months, we'll see how this uh, 
this market react to the, 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 the project that we have in the, on the pipeline. So, so we heard in the previous session about how Norway, in working with Indonesia, has a very high level government to government approach. Um, you've given us an example of, of, of on the ground conservation approach, which you as a company are committed to. Um, the, the rest of you also have organisations that are very engaged in sustainability because it's good for business. Whose responsibility is it to conserve forests? Is it a government responsibility? Is it your responsibility as the private sector? Who do you think should really take the lead on this? Or how do you think people should work to together to achieve this, given the economic constraints that you've talked about? Um, I guess from the palm sector very quickly, I think for us it's it's not as clear because we don't, we theoretically, especially if we're in Indonesia, we're not, we're not technically allowed to keep forest in areas that are set aside for agriculture. Um, so for us, it's slightly more complicated. I'll give you an example of, of work that we're currently doing in South Sumatra. In South Sumatra, um, Wilmar has assisted with the RSPO certification of the world's largest group of independent smallholders. So this covers around 6,000 hectares and 3,000 smallholders. Now, part of that project is to go ahead with um, replanting. And essentially, the idea is that we're, we're going to work with um, financial institutions, um, pull up the downstream partners up front to, to share the risk of that, um, and essentially go through the process of uh, financing um, that replanting process um, to ensure that the replanting is done sustainably. Now, the, the question mark then becomes, how much forest can you claim that you've saved with the replanting of very good seedling material? So, for example, if you're, if you're continuing to plant um, high-performing or high-yielding materials, how much can you prove the additionality of what you've saved, the indirect part? And I think for the palm sector, where we have zero control, because essentially what it is is, it's, is we've prevented a farmer from buying, say, another 10 hectares to plant. Um, but you can't prove that because that's a, you know, it, it hasn't happened yet. He doesn't own that 10 hectares. So the way we see it is the only way to make it work is essentially it's going to be a mix of governmental and private, and that is essentially the jurisdictional approach. So in this particular case, what we would hope to see um, is once we've gone through with the replanting, then that area saved, if that's recognized by the uh, region of South Sumatra, then that could provide an impetus to say, well, okay, we've saved this much and how much are we gonna get in terms of red financing? But without that, that link to the government, it's very difficult from the agriculture side um, to, you know, to, to, to even begin to say whose responsibility is it? Because if we don't plant it, and Wilmar has had a very bad experience of this in 2010, um, we set aside um, about 300 hectares of um, high conservation valley forest in, um, at the time, an area in central Kalimantan where we had a um, initial license or permit. Um, that area was taken away from us um, and the permit was re, uh, redone because we had essentially not met what the government had asked us to do. Um, and that 300 hectares essentially has then been cleared by a small company. Um, so again, is, is, was that the fault of Wilma? I don't think it was. And I think we've managed to, 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 to prove that point um, to the RSPO. But again, it's not our responsibility because we are agriculture. Um, it has to come back at the end of the day to the, to the government in this, in this scenario. Well, that raises... I just want to go one question with you. That raises a question about leakage, sort of additionality. So one of the arguments against the sort of projects that Desano is doing is that if you do a project there, forest just gets down, chopped down some, somewhere else. So I might just ask you if you've got any thoughts on that sort of argument based on your own conservation efforts. Yeah, yeah, your previous question was a little bit um, strange. I mean, whose responsibility to, to protect forests? Whose responsibility is it to protect the planet? Come on, is, is everybody's responsibility, it's not just responsibility of the government or private sector or NGOs or scientists, everybody's responsible to protect the forest and the planet. Um, go back to leakage, I think right now a lot of people just think too much about leakage, think too much about potential instead of focusing in, in, in helping or supporting act, actors, doesn't really matter who they are to actually do the real action now on the ground and protect forest. Um, um, I just want to use an, uh, one example about the jurisdictional approach work that we have been doing with the South Sumatran governor and also recently with the West Kalimantan governor where the jurisdictional approach is, uh, is really good because it, it, it 
it brings in a range of actors. It brings together a lot of actors to work collaborate, collaborate, collaboratively on land use planning toward a very similar goal or common goals, which is in South Sumatra, for example, and also West Kalimantan, is to support green growth. So growth without you know, uh, destroying the, 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 the environment. And, and APP is proudly to be part of, part of that movement together with other, other, uh, other actors. And this is one way to address leakage at jurisdictional level. I mean, we cannot address leakage, I mean, anywhere. I mean, we... I would argue that it's impossible to measure, much less prevent leakage beyond a jurisdiction. And, and, and so we need to basically uh, uh, work on ways to do so, is, you know, uh, to, 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 to work on ways on how to uh, avoid leakage with, with the boundary that we can. Like for example, for APP, we try to use the jurisdictional approach to, to, to prevent leakage. Um, let me add in terms of leakage, I think for us is. Um the fact is, as a project developers, we are we have to basically have a verification every year when all the credits is being issued. But I think uh, from um, from a project perspective, is you can actually look into this as a look at the demographics. You look at the communities. If you have a lot of inflow migration, so in an area and suddenly that we are doing it very well, we get a lot of benefit, and you have more and more people going in. So the argument of leakage is less because technically these are you know these are the people that might be deforesting somewhere now they come in. So I think that's from a project perspective. But I agree with you. The fact is it's better to do jurisdictional. But the reality is in the jurisdictional, then you get into the bureaucracy again, right? You 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 know it's like we should be thinking more creative. There has there has to be a stream where there's a, a way to do this on a jurisdiction level, on a project level working with donor, so it's all everybody's responsibility, whether it's government, private sector, NGO, because we are fighting with time. You know, the fact is, the, if we make it more and more, like somebody mentioned, it's just getting more and more complicated, it's always harder, because down, down the road, five, 10 years from now, there will not be any deforestation issue anymore because there's no forest left to be deforested. So that's the other thing, you have to be thinking, hopefully, the past eight years of this, uh, you know, when we start learning about Red Plus, we start, we become more, we become smarter in terms of how we do things. We look at it, and then I think you also have to look at it in terms of the donors, the World Bank, the Mutra. They maybe they have to take risks. I think, uh, just like Mary said, it's about signal. If there's a market signal, private sector will come in. Just like her, you know, she has a fiduciary responsibility. If there's no signal, so for example, when I was in J.P. Morgan, I do real estate um, mortgages, underwriting, selling buildings, and. You know, that's what, uh, what we do. And I think my boss always said, Arsono, okay, you want to lend $50 million to this uh, company. Do you have a comparables? What are the rent? How can you, so the reality is in our space, there's no comparables. So no banking, no financial would dare to make a risk, to, to take that kind of risk, because they can just say, uh, you know, oh, you want to, let's say if I go to the bank and ask them, I need $10 million. And then they'll come to me and say, okay, that's one, this is great. I love these assets. Uh, is there any historical sales in this? No. Is there any comparables anywhere else? Something like this ever been sold? No. So what are you selling me? And then, oh, we're selling you this. Well, I don't understand this. So they don't fund it because of that reason. So. I'll just add a little bit to this, although enough's been said about leakage. It's, it's a, frankly, kind of a boring topic, and people have studied it to death, and you know, fortunately, through the UNFCCC, through VSPCS, and so many other groups, we have methodologies we can trust and that are going to account for this in a way that we, the rest of us can just kind of move on with getting the job done on the ground. And I think that's the benefit of the private sector, is we can act uh, where we have responsibility. And you asked a question ago, Martin, who has the responsibility? Everybody's got responsibility. It's definitely shared responsibility, but we have different opportunities to act, and that's what's important. And I think one thing that unites probably all four of us in the types of work we do is that we're all facing a mix of land use. We're all facing a mix of actions we can do to use that land to restore it, to conserve it, to enhance productivity, to intensify production in the right places. And that's what we need to be focusing on. We need to be taking this integrated approach that was discussed this morning, looking at land use planning, saying what is the best use for this area? How do I plan for the needs of this landscape, the functions of this landscape? And that's not business as usual. It is a change for all of us. It's something that we're all moving forward with. Um, just to give an example, I was out at our uh, investment in West Kalimantan last week, which is a, a rubber plantation project, 100,000 hectare concession, around a quarter of that is high conservation value or remaining forest that will be conserved through the project. 
uh, with a great deal of that. That's 25% HCV, I should say, and another 20 to 25%, which won't be used for production based on the way in which we've invested to maintain and recover forest uh, across that landscape. Now, out in the field looking at potential rehabilitation sites with the local team, they've got a great environment manager, a great social manager, GIS planning, sort of the high-level managers who are showing us around for three days. You get out in the field with the division manager who's responsible for that block of land, and he said through translation to me, you know, what do you think about this land? What do you want to do? And we talked about the, the fact that it was a, a wetland which had been impacted. There was uh, not proper drains, but some drying drains put in. There's roads through the middle of the wetland. These roads are going nowhere because this land's not going to be planted because it can't sustain rubber. It's far too wet. It's a silly road in the first place. So we talk about maybe you can decommission this road, how to restore water flows going through, and what's it going to take to replant. And he said, this is really interesting to me because in all my old jobs, my job would be to get this land as dry as possible, as fast as possible, so that I can maybe get a tree to stay alive on it. So this isn't just about change at the top or convincing the companies and you know all of us sitting here what we need to do. That has to filter down through layers and layers and layers of management. There's 36,000 workers at that plantation right now. So our challenge is how do we get them to understand the difference we're trying to make, the different model we're trying to aim for, and that we're not about eking every hectare into uh, plantation cover that we can, but we're about using that land wisely and redirecting it to the best use. And that takes a lot of effort. Uh, it takes a lot of science. It takes a lot of engagement. Um, and it's the challenge that I think we have in all of our businesses right now. So there is an interesting common denominator here, which you have touched on the jurisdictional approach, yet each one of your companies does projects. You basically do large-scale investments, either in conservation or agriculture. You manage them as a business. You run them. And, and you do that at an infrastructure level. So how, how do you see, if it requires... a a, company, a very sophisticated project a company or, or, or conservation company to actually run a large-scale activity, how do you see a government, what role do you see the government playing, such as, such as in these larger um, national jurisdiction type approaches? How do the two work together effectively to deliver conservation? Uh, it's it's got to be led by the government. There's, there's no other way around. It's got to be led by the government um, uh, for jurisdictional, for example, jurisdictional approach, for example. The leader has to be the governor. So the governor has to have a, a good team, a uh, technical team, uh, a funding team, and also uh, implementation partners, and a group of stakeholders in that particular jurisdiction um, and, and, and give them a clear roles and responsibility. But who's going to lead? It has to be the government. And when you say lead, what do you actually mean by lead? Because they're not going to be developing the project. They will be providing some of the governance frameworks, but that could take five, ten years. So you at the moment as a company are leading the conservation efforts through the foundation and other things. So when you talk about leadership, well, what do you actually mean by that? Involving, um, involving the input from the stakeholders underneath. I mean, I'm just using the South Sumatra jurisdictional approach as an example because it's been, the, it's been there for, for a year. So uh, when, when the governor is uh, designing the land, the land use plan for uh, the, 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 the term they use, the eco-region, so they want to develop the whole province to be in an eco-region. Uh, so uh, everything they do, the development they do, is going to minimize the environmental impacts as much as possible. So when they do that, for example, uh, if they want to develop land in um, one particular district in South Sumatra, then they will consult with the partners in that South Sumatra uh, district. What is the input from them? And then incorporate all the input and then implement that. It's sort of just one way uh, 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 directive instruction. So that's what the structure is looking right now. So uh, um, uh, right now, uh, what APP is doing in that particular area is focusing a lot more on uh, forest restoration and uh, conser conservation and protection. Uh, a lot, uh, a lot of works on the on the peatland as, as well. So that is reported to the to the to the district level, to the provincial level. We, we report it and embed our system into their into their system. But so then, when the governor is designing the whole uh, the whole province, they will look at they will, they will look at the progress made by the stakeholders, the particular district. So, involvement of stakeholders, uh, incorporating their input, transparency, 
embedding uh, the embedding the the system into the government system. Those are four keys, and why jurisdictional approach uh, need to be done. Um, and just to add to that, I think the. Uh, for us, and again, using the just just to be a little bit different, not not I mean, South Sumatra is great, but we also have a good example in Malaysia with Sabah. Um, and I think for the Sabah jurisdictional approach, the very clear answer in terms of where the government comes in is is essentially all about the land. It's about the land use planning, but it's also about the land authority. So if we, it's it's an opportunity to really look at landscape. Uh, approach to land use. So essentially, for example, um, the government is the only one at the end of the day that can say, okay, so if we've got smallholders that have been for 20 years, um, you know, planting in this national park or planting in this forest zone or forest estate, um, let's degazette that and then let's you know, take over some other land that has forest on it and let's turn that into, you know, conservation area. So it's all about making that work um, at sort of a wide level. And that, I think, essentially, at least for the Sabah view, that's really where the government is coming in. I mean, we're quite lucky in Sabah that we have uh, total commitment from the chief minister through the Sabah Forest Department. And so it's a combined, um, I guess, target of achieving full FSC certification for all the forests by 2017. Uh, maybe 2018, and then full RSPO certification for all palm production in the state by 2025. So it's a combination of both the forestry and the palm, and also looking at how you fix some of the fundamental problems with the smallholders at one go. But essentially, as Ida says, it's all about regulating certain components. So you know, if you've deforested, there is going to have to be a requirement to provide compensation for that, and then that's sort of where we have opportunities then with the Malwa Bayou Bank, um, and also projects such as that Darsono is doing. So that, that I think is where the, the beauty of the jurisdictional approach really takes, takes into consideration. I think um, the question is who should lead this? It's, um, um, I personally think that there should not be a leader. I personally think it's a collaboration of everybody. It's very hard when you say a leader. You then you have you know. I think uh, you know one thing that um, that I would hope to you know, uh, to see is to have a collaboration. Basically, collaboration between not only typically in uh, in the world, in Indonesia, it's between private sectors and government because they are the given the license giver and license taker. But I think you also have to start involving the people. I think in order to get this work. You know, all this conservation effort and, uh, um, you know, restoration effort is first, you have to make sure that there's a benefit to the communities, vis-a-vis uh, -vis financial benefit or, you know, all environmental benefit. But I think you also have to start teaching the communities accountability. You know, you cannot just say that, oh, you know, that, that's why we work on the ground. We really teach them. We socialize all this effort in terms of teaching them this is good, it's good for your health, but also benefit. We try to do, our, our, you know, all, find all options in terms of finding an alternative livelihood that is more sustainable than they have. So I think uh, we, every time I go to the village, I told them this is not the money, this red money is not money from heaven that can be taken just like that. It has, there is accountability. I am a, we are a private sector, we work hard for it. You are, as a community, also have to earn this. This is something that then we can start changing behavior. Because if the community start feeling that, oh, you know, this this is just money from heaven, we don't have to do, there's no accountability, then they always feel that they, it's their rights to deforest again. Right? So I think that's something very important that we have to say. So the collaboration between public, which is government, private sector as a company, and people to have that uh, change of, uh, basically change of the way we do business is something that we have to move forward. Um, I'll just touch on one example that we've got from Sabah as well, where um, in a joint venture partnership with Sifota, the Sabah Forestry Development Authority, um, and one of the great things about having a government partner is that they become a true stakeholder in the business and what you're trying to achieve and the objectives. So they're not only aligned from the larger Saba forestry objectives that they have, but they also want to see the business succeed. So that creates a really interesting opportunity for us to work through some of the challenges we have in that particular region. One of them is there's 64 communities in a 25,000 hectare gazetted area. It's quite packed. There's a lot of people. And increasingly, there's people coming from the outside. There's uh, villagers.
Okay, great. We've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to open it up to questions from the floor. So is there someone who would like to come to the microphone and ask a question? I'm sure somebody has a question. We've solved everything. Here we go. Hey, um, my name is Sam, and I'm an intern at the Center for Advanced Research in the local university here. Um, we heard a lot from big scale, like large companies such as all of yours, as you have mentioned earlier. But what about um, smaller and medium enterprises, such as like, which are very essential to smaller economies, such as Brunei's economy or uh, Malaysian economy? Um, what role do you think they could play in pr the preservation of rainforests as well? Thank you. I can speak to one side of scale, but I suspect my agribusiness partners will have uh, more to say. Uh, for us, you know, we're looking to encourage more small and medium enterprises within the areas in which we operate. Um, one of the best things we can do is help the villages to look at those alternative livelihoods, which Darsona mentioned, uh, to see what it means to perhaps develop your own contracting business, to get the community involved in that way, in planting, in harvesting, in restoration projects. Um, and also to look at true partnerships. So in Indonesia, working in an HTI concession, Hatei, we have a requirement for Tanaman Kahitapen, which is livelihood plantings. That's a great opportunity for new development of cooperatives at the village level where you can engage with those communities, ask them what their interests are, let them go away, take the time to develop their own, out, own objectives, and then see how the company can support them. Maybe it's a profit share, maybe it's a provision of a concessionary, loan, which I'm not a huge fan of, to, to plant something in the first place. There's all sorts of models that we can look at. And when you're talking at a certain scale within some of these larger operations, if we have a 100,000 hectare project, if it's going to plant 30,000 hectares of rubber, that means we've got an obligation for 6,000 hectares of livelihood plantings. That's you know several good small and medium enterprises that can be developed within that. So that's where we can play a part. But otherwise, you know, there's a, a great role for uh, NGOs and civil sector to really support those types of enterprises in developing. I mean, I, I do have an input, I think, and it's it's very clear, and I think I stated earlier, I think there's a problem with the with trying to get medium and smaller guys on board. I think um, part of the problem is if you look at comparative value, so let's say you've got two hectares of, I don't know, um, native title example, because uh, my, my family has some native title with a little bit of rubber, doesn't make a lot of money. But every time I broach the topic of something like this to my dad, my dad says, well, how much are you going to get of it per hectare? And I basically say, well, maybe $1,000. Um, and that's really not enough. If you're telling a small company that essentially they're going to have to think about the difference between, say, a hectare of palm, $10,000 value, versus potentially, oh, I don't know, you go through, jump a lot of, through a lot of hoops, do a lot of um, documentation stuff, and maybe you'll get $1,000. Um, I think it's a really hard decision. Um, but the, the challenge here is really to, to get the government, and again, sorry governments, but you know, it, it is part of your role to be looking at, well, why don't you look at subsidizing very much in the way that um, agriculture is subsidized, potentially, if, if, if countries are serious about it, let's look at subsidizing, uh, subsidizing conservation. But there's no quick and easy answer to that. I mean, small and medium companies, I think, are very much outside the discussion because they're not really plugged into the whole RED, Red Plus sort of discussion, and it's very complicated for them. Um, I guess I always consider myself to be small company because I guess three, four years ago, I'm the only employee of my company, so I am a small company. So I think, uh, you know, the fact is, uh, of course, we are, you know, we're not even close to APP and Wilmar. Uh, the fact is, we, you know, the reason why we manage such a big land is because of the, 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 the landscape itself, right? So. What I'm trying to say is, even somebody like me, seven years ago, can actually starting to do it. If we have become successful, there will be a lot of entrepreneur wanting to do this. So automatically, you are involved. You know, all these small and medium companies, if they see they want to do the right thing, I mean, there's a lot of new, newer generation in Indonesia right now, in the 40s and 30s and 40s, and they see this as, as an opportunity, and they're willing to take the risk as an entrepreneur. Unfortunately, there's no signal to follow me. I'm still a lone ranger out there, you know, it's like Darasono, you're still there, but I know for sure if we become successful in terms of implementing this and start making money, there will be more small, medium companies 
because this is a totally new business for a lot of people. So this is like a new wild, wild, well, no, I will not call it wild, wild west, but I think it's a new territory for a lot of people to be in because it's, 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 it's a sexy thing to be involved now, right? I mean, it's a, you know, you, you're talking about giving prosperity to the people, to the company, and to the planet. So everybody, all this younger generation wants to be part of this. But we just need to have a market signal that we can do it, so. I might just try to sum up, um, given we've just got a couple of minutes to go, I think. Is that right, Howard? Yeah. So I think it's been a very useful discussion today. I think one of the um, points that the designer made was, um, while for, while for three of our panellists, conservation is good for business, he made the point that conservation is his business. I think a lot of business now have hit that point and investors understand that conservation is critical for business. And what we're trying to move is, is, to, is to also get support from the finance sector and the capital markets for conservation as a business. And that's critically important. To do this, we've heard that the governments play a very important role in land use planning. And there's a lot more focus now on how do you plan large landscapes so that they're both productive as well as conserved. And also, um, this, this concept of collaboration between governments and private sector is very important. Ultimately, the private sector will deliver a lot of the outcomes, but they need government support to do that. And I think the final point among this is also that, that timing is key. Um, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and if we design a lot of schemes for a long period of time, the forest will just continue to disappear. So having some of that investment in the important initiatives that, that, that APP's foundation is doing and, and the others on the panel are doing is critical. And in that regard, um, the papers and the projects that have been, been produced as part of the Asia-Pacific um, Rainforest Partnership, which again, there are copies of this um, publication floating around, run you through some of the thinking that, um, that the organisations are doing and some of the policy papers about what's required. So I encourage you to, to, you can get a hard copy of that today or alternatively go online and get a copy of it. But a lot of e effort went into that under Ida's leadership and, and thank her very much for doing that. And I'd encourage you to read through those as well because it touches on many of the issues that have been raised today. So in concluding, I'd ask you to thank our panellists and we'll have a small break before the next session. Thank you. Thank you.